that's very kind of you both. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, we have a short session here, so I'm not going to take up uh, too much of your time. But my job here is to set the scene for what we would like to hear these two illustrious gentlemen to discuss. So um, what I would like to say is that we will be discussing on the edges of knowledge. So the question is, what is it possible to know? Is the physical universe all there is? Or is the immaterial part of reality too? So we're obviously joined by radical scientist Rupert Sheldrake and world leading skeptic Michael Shermer. Um, and they're going to go head to head on the subject of where the edges of knowledge lie. That's, that's what we're here to do. I personally love the idea of you two just having a full on conversation and we just get to spectate this. But I've been asked to get the conversation going with a particular question and each of you will get three minutes to sort of set up your store and then we'll just go from there. How does that sound? Great. Good. All right, so this is a question. What are the limits of human understanding? Rupert, I think you said that Michael may go first. Yes. How gentlemanly of you. Michael, you're up. Three minutes. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> All right, well, what are the limits of human knowledge? How would I know? If I knew, I would change my beliefs or whatever. We're stuck in the 21st century and we know what we know. So uh, I begin with the Copernican principle that you know we're not special and I apply it to myself. I'm not special uh, and so I'm not God, uh, omniscient and omnipotent. You're not God either, so we're in this together or if you prefer the secular version, there is an objective reality but I don't know what it is and you don't either. So we have to kind of collectively go through what we know and try to evaluate what we should believe. And I don't want to believe things that have to be believed in to be true. That is, reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away, as Philip K. Dick said. So that's our goal. And how do you get there? Well, through the tools of rationality and science. You know, reason and arguments, logic, and empiricism. You actually go out there and look out the window and see what the world is actually like and see if it matches your ideas, which may or may not be right. And to the best that you can, collect data from out there to see if it matches your ideas of what you think it should be like and then try to hone those. So I guess it depends on the particular topic of how confident we could be in the current theories. Um, the theory of evolution, you know, is is uh, over 150 years old now and it's pretty well established. But if we take a, a kind of a Bayesian approach by assigning some probability of something being true, true with a small t or not, somewhere between one and 99. So the uh, Cromwell principle in Bayesian reasoning, Oliver Cromwell, I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, you might be mistaken. Now he was talking about some political issue, but in Bayesian reasoning, this is you never apply a zero or a hundred to anything because you never know. It, you may be wrong in this end, you may be wrong in this end. So let's just put, so the theory of evolution, it's, you know, it's like 99% probably true with, you know, fine tuning if you're a neo-Darwinian or punctuated equilibrium or some, some little aspect of it. Uh, but it's not like the creationists are, are suddenly going to find something new because they've been looking for a century and a half and they haven't been able to overturn the theory. So uh, it's possible that Darwin was wrong, probably not. And so we don't assign 100% to it. We always have an open mind just in case. And, and, and you know, the Big Bang Theory, it's probably true. Here's a whole pile of evidence for it. Now, it, it's possible. It, it could be wrong, and this could be overturned. Probably not overnight. Probably not one experiment's going to overturn it. Uh, it would have to be, you know, a convergence of evidence to some other theory that explains everything the Big Bang Theory explains and these other anomalies. One of the problems we face in all theories um, is what's called the residue of anomalies. No theory explains everything, so you always have this residue of stuff that's not explained. And you have, so I use this example for UFOs, UAPs. You've seen these grainy videos and blurry photographs. What is that? And the pro-UFOlogists say, well, we acknowledge 95% of all those sightings are fully explicable by terrestrial phenomenon, geese and drones and Chinese spy balloons. So here we have this huge bin of 95%. And then you have the other little bin. It's aliens or it's the Russian Chinese drones or whatever. So you have a new sighting. Which bin do you put it in? Well, it's 95% likely to be in this big bin. 
So, and it's, you know, two and a half percent for each of the two little bins. It might be there, keep an open mind, just in case this is the one, probably not, right? So, you know, as, we, as the saying goes, if you hear foot hoof prints outside, think horse, not zebra. Or I guess here in Wales, think sheep, <laughs> not zebra. <laughs> I've seen a lot of sheep here. Uh, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's true. So that's the approach, you know, just, uh, you know, just, just assign some probability to it. I I'm keep an open mind with Rupert's ideas. He might be right, uh, but we'll see. Okay, well, oh, there we go. There's a bit Thank of you. that. Rupert, can you, can you tell us what your thoughts are on, on the limits of human understanding? I think there are certain intrinsic limits to understanding. There are certain things our minds may never be able to grasp. Um, I mean, after all, we live in a cosmos 15 billion years old with a, incredible number of galaxies and so on. It's, it'd be very strange if human minds in the 21st century could grasp all of it. Um, but I agree with Michael that one of the best methods we have is science, reason, discussion, evidence. Um, we don't disagree about that. But where we disagree is where we think the limits of science are or should be. I think that there are many things that we can investigate scientifically which are at present taboo uh, within the academic and scientific world. Um, and those taboos are maintained by organized groups of skeptics. And Michael's, as it were, one of the archbishops of the skeptic <laughs> movement. Uh, um, and, uh, so, uh, and many skeptics uh, patrol the frontiers of knowledge and there are vigilante skeptic squads set up all around the world. And, <laughs> Michael's trained many of them. He used to give, <laughs> he used to give workshops with the late magician James Randi on how to be a skeptic. And I know that they're very effective because their slogan was, next time a charlatan shows up in town, be the skeptic who the media ask you know, their opinion of. And how can you be an expert on this? Just say you are. Anyway, I know that because when I show up in town, all these trained skeptics um, feel that they ought to cancel me because I'm doing research that goes beyond the boundaries of what they think science should be. So this is an issue that's not just an academic issue. It comes in, it feeds into cancel culture. I had a TED talk that was, a TEDx talk that was censored because it ran foul of some uh, pretty uh, dogmatic scientists. Um, so I think that there are realms that we can investigate which are at present uh, almost impossible to study or get funded within the university or academic or scientific system. I call them the mysteries of everyday life. Um, some a favorite skeptic slogan is extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. But I'm dealing with ordinary claims. 95% of people say they've had the experience of being looked at from behind, turning around and seeing someone looking at them, the sense of being stared at. About 85% of people say they've had the experience of what seems like telephone telepathy, thinking of someone who then calls. About 50% of dog owners say their dog knows when, an owner's, uh, when a person, a member of the family is coming home. Now these are ordinary claims, they're made by millions of people, and lots of people say they happen on a regular basis. They're not weird, strange things like miracles that happened 2,000 years ago. They're ordinary claims. So can we look at them scientifically? For example, when people think someone's looking at them from behind, is it because people turn around all the time and occasionally someone's looking at them and they think, aha, there's some mysterious sense? So, or is it more than that? So you do controlled experiments with randomized trials uh, in which people are looked at or not looked at and they have to say whether they're looked at or not in a, and, and they're right or they're wrong um, and is it above chance? And the answer is in many experiments, there have been many published papers, yes it is. It even seems to work through closed circuit television. People who work uh, in the surveillance industry are completely convinced this is real. We've interviewed lots of private detectives security officers, surveillance officers, the drug squad at Heathrow, the store detectives at Harrods, um, places, people like that whose job it is to watch others. And in that world, there's almost no doubt this is real because they see it all the time. Yet, move into the world of 
academic science and the world, the citadel that's defended by the, uh, the uh, skeptic movement patrolling the frontiers, and this is just pseudoscience, doesn't exist. Telephone telepathy, is it just coincidence? Do people think of others all the time? Occasionally someone rings when they're thinking of them, they imagine it's telepathy, but they forget all the millions of times they're wrong. Well, we do tests for potential callers. The person's filmed the whole time, landline phone, uh, no caller ID. We pick the caller at random, ask them to uh, ring the person, their friend, and when the phone rings, they have to guess which of these four people it is before they answer the phone. By chance, they'd be right 25% of the time. In our film trials, they're right about 45% of the time. Hundreds of trials is very significant. Dogs that know when their owners are coming home, we film the dog. We have people come home at non-routine times uh, they don't know in advance, traveling by unfamiliar vehicles. Does the dog still go and wait at the door? 10 minutes or more before the person comes home? Yes, at least with the dogs we've studied. So I think the evidence is quite strong these things are real. But if you try and do a PhD on these things at a university, except for two or three exceptions, most of them here in Britain actually, um, you can't because these are completely taboo topics. And these taboos are maintained in force by active skeptics. So. Michael's a very nice chap, you know, he's friendly, he's funny, um, um, but uh, yep, where but. he and I... <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> where he and I differ, you see, is that I think these, uh, to investigating things we don't understand, that we don't have necessarily a theoretical explanation for, is the very essence of science, to explore what we don't know. Whereas some people, well, he says he's open-minded, let's say he is, but some of his colleagues are very definitely not open-minded, and uh, they just want to shut this down and, and stop what little investigation there is on these subjects because it doesn't fit their model of reality, which is usually the model of mechanistic materialism that says the mind is nothing but the brain, and therefore all your thoughts and intentions are inside the head, so how could they possibly affect someone at a distance these things are impossible, therefore the evidence for them is not worth taking seriously or even looking at. Now, just I'll finish by saying that that's not just a, a vague um, accusation. Stephen Pinker, in his book Rationality, um, where he argues for a rational and scientific approach, says that there's no need to look at the evidence for psychic phenomena that is so improbable on Bayesian statistics grounds, so incredibly improbable, it's a waste of time looking at the evidence. James Alcock, a leading member of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, which is the, one of the other skeptic organizations, Michael runs the Skeptic magazine, they run the Skeptical Inquirer. Um, Ours is the good one. Yeah, I, well, well, I subscribe <laughs> to the Skeptical Inquirer, actually. I, yeah. I, <laughs> I, will, I will make you an honorary member of the Skeptic magazine. Well, James Alcock, who's one of their most informed luminaries, a professor of psychology, wrote a paper in the American Psychologist last year, two years ago, saying, uh, exactly arguing that, that there's no need to look at the evidence because these phenomena are simply impossible. Therefore, it's a waste of time investigating them or looking at the evidence. Well, well, now, okay. that, in my opinion, is dogmatism which holds back science. Okay. First of all... <laughs> First of all, let's debunk the notion that these subjects are taboo and you're not allowed to talk about them. Here we are in a packed house talking about these ideas. You're one of the most famous public intellectuals in the world. You have numerous best-selling books. I see you on TV all the time talking about that. Who is censoring you? Nobody. So that's not what you mean. You mean mainstream scientists that you're trying to convince are not convinced of your evidence. That's the real argument I think you're making. Why is it that the Steven Pinkers, myself or whoever, don't accept them? Now, acknowledging that some skeptics are, as you describe, um, uh, but there's often a good reason for that because the evidence has not accumulated enough, converged to a particular hypothesis that overturns the mainstream theory and, and nudges us to accept that. It's just not there. And again, it's not that these things are taboo and no one is doing this research, as you know. 
by the way, Rupert and I have a book called Arguing Science. You can order it on Amazon, uh, in which we go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth on all these. And m most of the hypotheses he just described, staring at the back of the neck, the dog knows when the uh, owner's coming home, and, and so on, have been tested over and over. They fail to replicate most of the time, not all the time. There may be an experimenter bias. So the most famous one here was the um, replication by Marilyn Schlitz and Richard Wiseman. Richard Wiseman is a skeptic. Marilyn Schlitz is a believer. Okay, those terms are problematic, but whatever. They're kind of in those two different camps. And they each found different results. So, okay, where's the bias? Is it on the part of the skeptics to not accept the data? Is it on part of the believers to accept data that's not sound? Well, you just have to read the, the evidence. And so, you know, like, well, here I have these replicated experiments. Well, sort of, but, you know, half of all psych ex experiments have, not, have failed to replicate. You know, since the replication crisis began in 2008, not just your research, but half of all the most famous psych experiments you've ever heard of uh, should have probably never been published. Uh, they were based on like one experiment in which we all we know is the one that was published. The experimenter ran nine different experiments. Eight of them found non-statistically significant results. They published the one. The rest go in the file drawers called the file, file drawer problem and so on. This is very common, not just in psychical research, but all research, right? So acknowledging that, Pinker is, is skeptical of, of half of these psych experiments. You know, you're standing at the top of the escalator, you give more money than at the bottom of the escalator. Or you have the power pose, you know, if you put your shoulders back and your chin up and so on, your testosterone goes up. And, and this is what women should do. They should have the power pose when they go, yeah. That's what I was doing right before we <laughs> came in here. I, I noticed that. It was, <laughs> it was working. I was intimidated. No. Uh, that failed. This was one of the most famous TED Talks. You know, it was like 40 million views of this power Power pose TED talk never re replicated. So now the pinkers of the world are skeptical of all of that too, not just yours because of the failure to replicate. You know, so it's not enough to just have, I have this one experiment in which I found the statistically significant result. That's not enough. You have to have it replicated over and over and over till it's really obvious and almost everybody looking at it goes, yeah, okay, that, that probably really happened. And you get kind of a consensus. Again, not 100%, but you know, just the, the majority, like climate consensus. What does that mean? It's not a vote. It's that most of the scientists that study climate change agree. It's probably human caused, and so on, it's happening, you know, that kind of thing. Well, I, we agree that most papers in psychology don't replicate. Most papers in biomedical science don't replicate. Yeah, exactly. But psychic researchers were accused of this. So they've been subject to much more scrutiny than any other branch of science for much longer. And in, in psychical research, um, people publish negative results and failed replications. In most of science, they don't or didn't until the replication crisis. And it's simply not true that most of these things don't replicate. The sense of being stared at has been replicated many, many times. And even skeptics who've tried doing the experiments, most skeptics don't do any experiments, but there's a few who do. And most of them got positive results when they tried this. Um, Susan Blackmore, a leading British skeptic, did, had a PhD student. They got positive results. They were never published. And when I asked to see the raw data, they'd been lost. Richard Wiseman who did staring experiments, got positive results first time round when the students were doing the staring. So he replaced them with himself as the starer, and then he got the results he expected, no effect. In his experiments with Marilyn Schlitz that Michael referred to, they were looking at people through CCTV, measuring whether they could be, uh, whether their skin resistance, their emotional arousal changed when they were being looked at at random times uh, through closed circuit television. She, um, produced positive effects. They changed when she was looking at them. Richard Wiseman, uh, when he was looking, they didn't produce positive effects. Now, it's not symmetrical. She couldn't produce positive effects in this just by wanting to, unless there was a real sense of being stared at. But he could produce non-significant effects by not looking very hard. And when, he was when he was interviewed afterwards, he said it was such a boring experiment. He, you know, he just didn't look very hard. So uh, these are not symmetrical. Um, and so, if you go into this actual literature, uh, you'll find that the idea it just doesn't replicate is not true. And the um, sense of being stared at has been replicated, telephone telepathy has been replicated independently at Freiburg University and Amsterdam University. There's a much more persuasive body of literature than 
Michael's summary would lead you to believe. And the result of this is that if you listen to skeptics, say, oh, it's all inconclusive, it's been replicated, it's all disputed, etc., then what's the point in going into the detailed literature? It just seems like a waste of time, even though there is all this evidence. But the main reason, I think, uh, for the uh, rejection or dogmatism or prejudice against these uh, phenomena, by prejudice I mean prejudging um, the issue, the main reason is the materialist theory of mind, which is very much the belief system of most card-carrying skeptics I know are materialists. For them, the mind is the brain, and it's inside the head, and it shouldn't be able to do all these other things. Um, therefore, the prejudice is much greater. It's not just a matter of evidence. The same materialists are perfectly happy to accept the theory of physicists that there are quadrillions of universes beside our own, the multiverse theory, without one shred of evidence. Dark matter and dark energy, 95% of reality, uh, physical reality, just theories, no evidence at all, uh, except they make the equations balanced, so you can add in the fudge factor of just as much as you like, titrate in as much dark energy to make the equations of physics balance to explain the universe as it is. Uh, that doesn't provoke anger or, 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 or attacks from most skeptics. Uh, can, physicists have a get out of jail free card for, but as soon as you come to anything that challenges the central belief the mind is nothing but the brain and therefore there's no consciousness out there in the universe, there's no God, there's nothing uh, beyond uh, consciousness limited to human and animal brains and possibly the brains of extraterrestrials then when you challenge that worldview, that's where the problem kicks in. And almost no amount of evidence is going to be enough uh, because we're dealing here with a fixed belief system highly aided by confirmation bias. Should I? Well, I, I just wanted to say, so what, for, the, for the audience's sake, so I, I'm also a, a scientist. I'm a, I'm a researcher. I work in the bench. And what's remarkable about this conversation that we're seeing unfolding is, of course, there's multiple subjects. But the central point is um, about what is evidence? Whose evidence do you believe? And therefore, what constitutes actual knowledge, right? And this is the type of conversation that happens regardless of whether or not you're talking about a particular phenomenon within a cell or whether we're talking about the kind of phenomena that, that Rupert's discussing here. So um, I think actually there's a really big subject happening and that we're touching upon here about basically knowledge and, and who, whose knowledge is, what is knowledge but the evidence provided by different people, and who do you choose to believe, right? right? Yeah, yeah, that's the hard part. <laughs> so, you know, again, it's a, it's a social community of people that work uh, in a field, and, you know, there, then there are the people that are kind of on the margins, and then the people that are way out here. And so, you know, Rupert and I both get these uh, alternative theories of physics. There's hundreds of them. I, you know, you get them every week. And, you know, what do you do with those? And why don't they have a platform here? Well, which ones? And so the mainstream scientists sort of by necessity have to think, well, they're probably in the little bins that are not going to likely to pan out. So we have to kind of concentrate on the, you know, the mainstream and the, just the few challenges from maybe some... I don't know, renegade scientists or whatever, they're here. I mean, there's several people here that are challenging the dark energy, dark matter of the Big Bang and so on. I've heard them, and they're not fringe. They're not tinfoil hat wearing wackadoodles. They're like professors, like, like real scholars. Okay, so again, where's the censorship? They, they are out there. <laughs> they are there are books about string theory as just being complete bullshit. So, uh, and I get them all the time. So what's, where's the censorship? The problem is, is that you want those those kind of anecdotal or fringe or challenging ideas to become the mainstream, why aren't they? And I would argue you just haven't made the case strong enough because it is an extraordinary claim in a sense saying that, you know, 400 years of physics is wrong because I ran this experiment in which somebody could detect somebody staring at the back of their neck or the BEM experiment of subjects looking at computer screens trying to guess which side the erotic image was going to pop up versus the neutral image left or right uh, and you know and you know, BEM ran nine experiments this one gets published 53 percent you know 50 50 but 53 percent of the images that were erotic 
you know, basically pornography, uh, were detected by college students, you know, more than the neutral image, right? So when Bam goes on the, the Colbert report, he called this extrasensory pornception, right? <laughs> and that, you know, so what's more likely, that 400 years of physics is wrong because some social scientists showed porn pictures to college students? Or he's just mistaken in there. There's some error he made. He just screwed up the methodological problems. Right? So before you overthrow the 400 years of physics, maybe we should look at this one a little more carefully and really make sure it replicates over and over and over before you throw out the big theory there. That's my response. Well, that's a rhetorical argument I've heard many times, Michael. Um, well, thank you. Overhearing <laughs> for overthrowing 400 years of physics. I mean, you know, I, Susan Blackmore, for example, used this against me on, in an article she wrote in the Times Educational Supplement. What's more likely, that 400 years of physics, the whole edifice of science, all modern technology, mobile phones, TV, all of that is wrong, or that Sheldrake's right? You know, that is a false opposition. Damn, I That's, thought I came <laughs> up with that argument. <laughs> That was Susan's <laughs> argument. The, okay. the, the, um, Nothing's original. The, the, nobody's saying 400 years of physics is wrong, except for some physicists who are right here in Hay on Wai. Um, um, the, I'm certainly not saying that. What I'm saying is that mechanistic materialism, the dominant orthodoxy or paradigm of science for more than 100 years, is that it's very weakest dealing with consciousness and minds, precisely because it denies that consciousness is anything but the activity of matter. And its least successful areas are to do with minds. And they're the least understood things, really. That's why consciousness studies is such an important field in science now, the last 20 years or so, because we understand, oddly enough, least of all about the nature of our own minds. And we don't even know the extent of our minds. Um, and so it's not as if physicists have actually studied the nature of consciousness or minds. They've studied quantum particles and galactic movements and or planetary orbits and the behavior of electrons. So the fact that physicists haven't studied these subjects at all, it means that physics is almost irrelevant to this question. There may be properties of minds that uh, go beyond anything that physicists study in quantum particles have found, just as there are properties of life uh, that go beyond what physicists would... But Rupert, Roger Penrose is here. He's one of the greatest scientists of all time. He wrote a book about the hard problem of consciousness being somehow explained by these quantum fields inside the microtubules of neurons and so on. His whole theory that you, I think, would be uh, attracted to because he's challenging the mainstream and he's a physicist. So what are you talking about? Well, his theory of quantum non-locality, he applies quantum theory to uh, consciousness, uh, but he confines it to microtubules, which are small macromolecular structures inside nerve cells. And I think the mind is extended far beyond the brain. I think my image of you is located where you're sitting, not inside my head. I don't think there's a little Michael inside my head. Oh. I think my own view is projected out to where you are. <laughs> yeah, and I because know. it's projected out, if I were looking at you from behind and you didn't know I was there, it might affect you because it's projected out. And I did once say to Roger Penrose, you believe that consciousness is extended, but why stop at sort of 10 microns inside the microtubule? Uh, why not let it extend for hundreds of yards or even miles uh, when we're looking at distant things? And he hadn't really got an answer to that. He only said, you've got to start somewhere. <laughs> I mean, that's a, as good a, an answer as any. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you look up, just look under Wikipedia of hard problem of consciousness, there's like two dozen theories, right? So you have one, Roger Penrose has one, but they're not the only ones. And none of them have convinced the majority of neuroscientists and so on that that's the right one. So what do you do? Well, you just wait. Let's just keep trying to figure it out. So we, we don't have very long left in the debate, unfortunately. But in these last five minutes, I actually want to pick up exactly where you just uh, left that, which is, all right, so... Of course, even academic science is the pursuit of many different theories, and some theories are less likely. But there are many things that we now hold to be true 
the classic one, of course, being that we are in a solar system going around the sun. That used to be a fringe idea, right? That was very much to the edge of, of academic acceptance. Um, and now it's just true. So here's my question and for the last sort of few minutes of this debate. How, how is it that ideas go from being an idea to being tested to actually becoming accepted? And of course, evidence is a big part of it. I'm a scientist, so I would say that. But also, you know, we all kind of have that human experience of knowing that popular opinion tends to also sort of seep in on occasion. You know, even when talking about scientific theories, we'll be like, oh, well, you know, everyone sort of agrees on this one, right? So what, what happens in that uncomfortable interface between actual evidence and the fact that we are sort of susceptible to what everyone else thinks? And how does sort of the prevailing knowledge and dogma mm. come into to formation through those two interfaces? Well, that is, that is the hard question. And it's kind of a sociology of science question or a history of science question. And it really, so it's a burden of proof argument. Who has the burden of proof? You know, the mainstream person to, to uh, re refute your arguments or the, is the burden on you? And you end up with this, what Dan Dennett calls burden tennis. You know, no, the burden is on you, whack. No, the burden is on you, no, whack. And everybody has their data sets. And just, just different fields, say, uh, climate skeptics. There's a lot of them in America, you may have heard. And uh, so they write me all the time. And they, 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 they want to know why the climate community won't accept their alternative theories of global warming, that it's not human cause, it's volcanoes or sunspots or whatever. And, and the answer is, is because, A, you're not a climate scientist, you know, you're a lawyer or whatever, and, uh, and, and you're not publishing in mainstream climate journals, you don't go to climate conferences, you don't know anybody that works in the field, and your evidence isn't very good, so the burden is on you to convince all these climate scientists you've got some viable alternative, and they haven't done that. And this is where this 97% figure, 97% of climate scientists say, well, that just comes from a sort of study of the abstracts of 10,000 papers on climate science. And the 3% the are over here, and they go, well, I have all my alternative theories, but they don't converge to anything that would overthrow, you know, the anthropogenic theory of climate change. Okay, so that's it. And that's true for all fields. It's just, that's just the way it goes. You're not the only one. There's a bunch of people with alternative theories of consciousness and so on. And they haven't convinced everybody, so too bad. Keep working. Well, I mean, you're, you're basically, your position is basically one of conservatism. Um, yes. You're a scientific conservative. Not politically. What a, no, not political <laughs> conservative. No doubt a social liberal. We haven't discussed that. But, um, <laughs> uh, uh, but scientific conservatism. Yes, yes, yes. Basically, what the authorities say, what's published in Nature and Science, what gets funded by the National Science Foundation, that's science. And that's really part of the paradigm or, or sociological aspect that yeah. Ganesh said, talked about. The, what Thomas Kuhn showed in his famous book on stru the structure of scientific revolutions is it's not just about evidence and reason and logic. It's to do with what is collectively uh, a collective belief system at a given time. And if you have really good evidence that doesn't fit into that system, it'll be ignored or treated as anomaly or marginalized. And then a scientific revolution occurs which incorporates these anomalies. Like in the early 20th century when the idea of continental drift was first put forward because if you look at the globe, the continents fit together and they might have drifted apart. When Wegener produced, uh, produced that idea, it was ridiculed for decades until a mechanism was found and then it's now it's the standard view, plate tectonics. Um, there have been many cases where in the 18th century when people found hot stones falling from the skies, they were denounced by the scientific authorities as being credulous peasants because there couldn't be stones falling from the sky because there are no stones in the sky. We now know they're meteorites and, 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 and so on. So um, it depends really on a larger consensus change. And I think we are actually on the threshold of a change, a larger change, which would and part of it would be a change that includes consciousness as part of our model of reality instead of marginalizing it as to an epiphenomenon of the brain. And when that happens, I think we'll have a much broader view. It will lead to knock-on effects in say, areas like medicine, where at present official medicine, mechanistic medicine, physics and chemistry, surgery and drugs, there are many alternative therapies. Um, and if we um, have a broader, more holistic worldview, 
then I think, we not, I'm not suggesting we accept every claim of every therapy, but we could have, uh, as there already is it to some degree in the United States, comparative effectiveness research, finding out what works. And it may be some of these therapies work as well or better than traditional uh, mechanistic medicine. And then skeptics will say, well, it's just the placebo effect. But then say, well, okay, that's really interesting. The placebo effect is itself a healing modality. And, and if one treatment can unleash more placebo effect than another, it may work better. So we can open up a whole new way of thinking instead of just closing down. Here in Britain, the Medical Research Council, as far as I know, funds no research on alternative or complementary medicine. Um, it focuses more on you know, mechanistic medicine. And um, I, so I think this worldview, which would, I think it'll also be propelled by political factors because mechanistic materialism, which treats the whole earth as in, a devoid, inanimate, etc., underlies the exploitative model we have of nature. It's led to the great imbalance between humanity and nature. Uh, that itself, the, the political, the climate crisis, uh, will, I think, force a change in the way we think. I think we're on the threshold of a, a major shift in consciousness in which the kinds of anomalies I've been talking about that don't fit into the mechanistic picture will become part of a new world model. Now, I'm someone rooting for that. Michael's on the other side saying, you know, let's keep, it works well enough as it is, let's keep well, things well, as they oh, are. Well, that's, that's a bit usual. unfair, surely. <laughs> uh, I'm putting well, words what, into your mouth, Michael. This is what's called the survivor, su survivorship bias. That is, he just gave examples where the scientists turn out to be wrong and the alternative theorists turn out to be right. Plate tectonics with continental drift and meteorites and so on. But what about the 10,000 alternative theories that turn out not to be right? Where are those people? No one writes biographies of them. All the alternative people think they're Galileo, going up against the church. But most of the people in the past several centuries that were had these alternative theories, they were wrong. And that's why we never hear, hear about them. Well, as is always the case in these situations, we really don't have enough time. Please, can you put your hands together in, in thanks to our wonderful speakers. Thank you.